Elaine. All right. So good afternoon or good, good noon to you today. Um, glad you could join us for the geothermal of Midwest. This is an update of the of, uh, kind of the committee we've been working on and uh, release of our, our uh, white paper and information on projects we've had going on. Um, I'm Jay Solomon, uh, natural resource environment and energy educator based in Northwest uh, Illinois uh, for U of I extension and uh, moderating this session today. Uh, our presenters today will be uh, Dr. Yufang Lin, who's the director of the Illinois Water Resource Center, principal research hydrologist, Prairie Research Institute, uh, clinical professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineer, research professor in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences, all at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. will be our first speaker. Second one will be Dr. Ryan Doherty. Uh, he is president of the Geo Exchange uh, Organization is based in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, Dr. Andrew Stumpf, who is a principal principal research uh, scientist and uh, with the Illinois Geologic Survey, Illinois State Geologic Survey at the Prairie Research Institute at the uh, U of I Extension or U of I campus in Champaign-Urbana as well. Um, we'll be hearing from one of our grad students, Miss Josiane Yellow, uh, well, sorry, uh, PhD uh, candidate uh, in the Department of Civil Engineering University of Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana as well. Um, next presenter will be uh, Dr. Uh, Tucci Baser, who's a assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering uh, at the U of I in Urbana. And then the last presenter will be uh, Frank Holcomb, who is, with, is a senior researcher with the US Army Engineering Research and Development Center. Uh, construction engineering laboratory uh, based there on the campus in Champaign-Urbana. Um, so that will be your, your presenters for the day. Um, we're going to be, as you, you gather, a fairly large stack of presenters going through this very quickly. Um, and so it won't take up a whole lot of time here. A uh, couple of key things to note is we are recording this session. Uh, we'd ask that you, uh, you know, keep your camera off and, and I think your microphones are, are muted at this point. So we get a good recording out of it. And the other piece of this is as you have questions, please type them in the uh, in the, the chat book chat area for us. And we'll be asking those at the end. I'll be keeping an eye on it to see if there's any clarification questions that we need to ask the presenters as we go through it as well. So I'll give you a heads up to the presenters that we'll be doing that. So with this, as a way of introducing all of what we're talking about here, I'd like to uh, turn this over to uh, Luke, you, to you, Fang Lin, uh, to get us started. Thank you very much, Jay, and this is great. And so uh, before I start, I need, I'd like to uh, share the screen so I can share my PowerPoint. And uh, my Zoom message told me the host has disabled the participant screen sharing. So if I can get it on, that'd be great. And uh, while we are trying to have my share screen. And uh, um, so again, my name is Yvonne Forrest Lane, and uh, I am a groundwater guy by training. And then how do I get into geothermal? And uh, I will ask that question. I ask that question myself all the time. So is everybody seeing my screen, my uh, slides? Looks okay, perfect. thank you. Looks perfect. Okay. So this one shows why a groundwater guy like me get involved into geothermal. So University of Illinois has been really proactive um, uh, reduce the carbon emission on campus. So start from 2015, we have Illinois Climate Action Plan. And then I was involved in the process when I saw the document as a figure three shows here, geothermal won't start until 2035. So at that time, several of 
our scientists include myself and natural scientists, but also uh, campus sustainability uh, coordinator, and then a, a lot of good friends get together and say, how can we get it start earlier? And so that's how we start. And then at that time, I was also conducting a research funded by National Science Foundation and focus on subsurface temperature. And our study result shows a subsurface temperature is not that simple as a lot of people think it's just one value fits all, or it's a constant, or it's a linear. So that's what this diagram shows you. On your left hand side is, yeah, it's some certain depths. It could be kind of a constant, but when you have much better sensor, much better study, well, it shows uh, not quite. It could be really different, depends on your subsurface material. And even when there's a groundwater uh, system in there. So on your right hand side, you can see when we hit the Mahama Aquifer about 70 meter depths, the slope of the temperature change significantly. So this shows subsurface information matters. And that's how we really get into the study of, okay, how can we understand our subsurface better? And then also help the geothermal development on campus at the same time. And that's how we all start working with campus. And then our students just so, how do I say that? They are awesome. They are amazing. They, they think forward about, you know, we are not just this and our lecture here on this campus. We want to express how we want our future to be. So, so really we work with students a lot. And then, and not only our students, uh, uh, students in Wisconsin, they also have experience working on geothermal before us. So we get students from Wisconsin and work with our students on campus. That's the live picture shows both Students from both campus work together. This is just one of things. They, they talk on how we study subsurface temperature, how we design uh, the machine for doing the thermal response test, which is the, the middle photo shows Wisconsin BO2 already and uh, multidisciplinary study. They have students from mechanical engineering, civil engineering, charge work on this. And we have students from the similar area work together. So by learning from Wisconsin's uh, pro and cons, and we build even better machines to study uh, that subject. And then with student sustainability committee's help, they chipping some money. We build our first res uh, research station, we call geothermal research station on campus. And really from ground zero, and then we have that capacity. And uh, in, I think it's 2017. And then with all of those work, we start publishing from, uh, we, we work on uh, conference presentation and then papers and then reports on that. So of course, that's just the beginning of the story. There's far more than that. Once we build that uh, uh, geothermal research station, we get a preliminary result. And then we have faculties, for example, like Tushi, uh, who will talk later. And then we have extension get involved. And we have our uh, colleagues and students and Frank all involved. And then our trader on campus involved. We have our facility and service involved. And we start getting more projects and more experience going on. So another colleague, his name is Tim Stark, they install the idea about how about Let's try to put a geothermal energy exchange loop, not just in a boho, how about put it in an energy shelf and which can use for civil engineering project and can use for the bridges and then use different kind of drilling techniques for that. So now we try, well, what we're trying to do is make a really universally, you know, become a test bed of a lot of innovative geothermal energy research and then become like a, I, I, I preach I preach like to my, my colleagues uh, in geoscience as a density land for the geothermal research. Everybody's welcome. And then we use that to really progress these um, renewable energy solutions. 
And then we use that. Then we even got DOE involved. We wrote proposal to DOE and DOE funders. And then we start working with much bigger uh, uh, circles. So we start working with DOE. DOE stands for Department of Energy. And then national labs and other universities. And then we publish papers. So we try to make our uh, efforts wider and in different kind of application and not just think about, okay, we make a geothermal energy uh, technology better, but how about applications? And then so campus as a test bed is a wonderful idea because think about our campus. I mean, our dormitory is just like a residential settings and like a military installations. Our um, computer centers, and uh, just like a data center, Google and uh, Apple, Microsoft needs is so cooling dominant. They need cooling for their big hot server on that. And then we have our cattle farms and then the cattle farms for the agriculture application, we have, we have greenhouses and for agriculture application too. So, so we use campus as a living lab. It really gives us a lot of opportunity to do those R&D and save our Illinois uh, industry and also our, uh, uh, agriculture application, a lot of in capital investments on R&D and uh, help them to go for the uh, economical development and uh, uh, energy saving on that. And then that's how we start talking to our Illinois industry. And then fortunately we meet Ryan and who is going to talk after me and then really educate us about what really matter and what industry needs. And so what we do, what we have been doing here will be really matter and really help uh, our uh, farmers and then the uh, uh, industry in Illinois and to be competitive, not only in the nation, but also globally, because geothermal, a lot of Asian country and also European countries really ahead of us. And how can we not only catch up, but even live forward ahead of them. So even our capital pressure on campus and by using our study, then we improve the cost efficiency of our energy, uh, our capital project. For example, one of the, uh, the, the newest building on campus, and we cut down the paper year from 40 years to 28 years because of our study. And that's just one example of how much money we save and it's all on the newspaper of it. So the innovation part of it is the key, how we can step ahead of the curve of it. So later you will hear from Professor Tushi about their work and the graduate student is a work in progress. And we work this uh, as a team together. Campus seven units all work together on this. And then outside of campus, and we have Ryan, we have an industrial partner, we have national lab, we have DOE all work with us on this. And even internationally, we host international workshop for years already. And even last week, I got a Wired magazine interview me and, and they have a latest article. If you got a chance to access the Wired website, if you heard about this magazine, if not, you probably heard about Vogue already. And it's the same company for the fashion, Vogue, but I'm not really a fashion guy to put on a Vogue for that. <laughs> but but it, 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 this Illinois really has become uh, a, a, a capital for the geothermal, special low temperature geothermal application and then research for it. And then what's next? Well, we really need to talk about all about development. And then what's our vision of it? And what's our circle for collaboration? So we work with working on a white paper and then actually make it a lead document on the website. So we will very frequently update such information. Those information is a much, much bigger thing behind uh, the people you will see today. So that's my quick introduction for everybody. And then uh, you will hear a lot of exciting uh, stories and uh, news uh, from all my colleagues here. So without further ado, let me pass the microphone or the screen to Ryan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin. Uh, it's great to be here today with so many 
familiar names and faces. And I am going to go out on a limb here and try to share a slide deck. Let me see if this works. Uh, is that full screen or do you see the present presenter? Looks good. Okay, great. Th thanks. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lynn, and, and thanks, Jay. Uh, just one small correction. I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV. So it's easy to it's easy to make that mistake. Um, but my name is Ryan Doherty. I'm with the Geothermal Exchange Organization. We are a nonprofit uh, that works in the geothermal heat pump industry. We, we represent professionals and companies who make up this wonderful industry, delivering the most efficient heating and cooling technology in existence. Our focus uh, for, for many years has primarily been on federal policy, uh, but I'm an alum of the University of Illinois, and it's been about five years ago when I first met Dr. Lynn and Dr. Stump, and they we had lunch in Champaign, and it was great to be back, my old stomping grounds, and they told me that they wanted to make the University of Illinois a center of an excellence for this technology. I was very enthusiastic, but little did I know that that would become a reality. And I was really gratified and amazed to have recently had the opportunity to visit uh, the energy farm there on the South Campus and see the wonderful work that's going on, not only there, but in other parts of campus. Uh, it's truly amazing uh, how the university has become this wonderful source of research development and uh, policy making around geothermal heat pumps. And it's been uh, wonderful to partner with the, uh, in the university in that effort. So why do we need the white paper? Why is the white paper uh, that Dr. Lin referenced important? Well, there's tremendous growing interest in this technology. And one of the reasons is because of some legislation that was passed last year, which in many respects is the most ambitious climate legislation in our nation's history. Uh, there are a number of provisions that we worked very, very hard to see through that are in this law that benefit geothermal. So there's rising awareness and there's rising interest in the technology and it's things like uh, the white paper and other activities that are happening at the university that are more important than ever. Um, when it comes to geothermal heat pumps, you may think that you know them. They're not a new technology. They've always just kind of been a niche technology, um, but they're, they're not your grandfather's heat pump uh, these days. There's lots of advancements in the technology. You have variable speed compressors, uh, variable speed uh, pumps. These are very highly engineered machines, but at their core, they're not that complicated. It's, it's a lot like your refrigerator or your air conditioner, but if you took that piece of equipment and connected it to the earth and used the earth as a battery, as a thermal battery to derive super efficient, very, very efficient um, heating, cooling, and domestic hot water production. And this is a platform that one company, Water Furnace International, has that you can buy their equipment, install their system, and you can see in real time, how is this working? How, how is it connecting to and, and uh, interacting with the earth to give me that real, real high efficiency and cost savings? And that's really what it's all about. It's about saving money for a building owner, for a homeowner, and it's about saving emissions. This is an all electric te heating technology. There's no fossil fuel combustion. It's very, very efficient. It strengthens the grid. And so we can see here on the Symphony platform, all of these units operate in real time. Look at the bottom there. These people are paying 60 bucks a month over the course of a year for heating, cooling, and hot water. $700 for all of that for the average homeowner uh, over the course of a year. I can't stress enough the efficiency of these, these systems. It's been really exciting to see the growth of 
campus and district geothermal systems. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. You've got a dorm, dormitory, you've got classrooms, you've got recreational facilities. They all have different thermal needs. They all have different thermal profiles and they're used at different parts of the day. What if you connected those buildings together and just started sharing and shifting energy around a campus? Well, there's a lot of universities, a lot of corporations and other institutional facilities that are doing just that. And this is mentioned in the white paper. I urge you to, to pay special attention to that section of the document. This is a growing trend and we're just gonna see more and more of it. It's not only universities. There are, there are all geothermal communities that are springing up, even in, in Illinois. Um, these are just a few, a few uh, snapshots or, or logos and some headlines from stories that have featured some of these communities. It's the same sort of concept though. If you're building a new subdivision, why would you want to uh, put new natural gas in when you can just go geothermal? Utilities are embracing geothermal and you're starting to see them get into the business. I mentioned the grid resiliency of geothermal. They reduce the peak demand. And one of the reasons people say we can't decarbonize buildings is because you're gonna drive up winter peak. Well, that doesn't apply here. We're using the constant temperature of the earth uh, to cut down on those peaks. Finally, I'll mention um, uh, IGSPA, our partner organization, the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association. My uh, dear friend and colleague, Jeff Hammond, dialed in today. They are the flip side of our organization. They're focused on building out the workforce of the future to serve uh, all customers and households with geothermal. And they're the training and standards and accreditation or certification arm of the industry. If you have people doing work in your community around geothermal, it's very, very important that they have the stamp of approval from IGSPA. And I know I'm a minute over time, but I really appreciate being here today. And I wanna pass it off to my great friend, uh, Dr. Andrew Stumpf. Take it away, Andy. Uh, thank you, Ryan. That was a great presentation and thanks for everybody uh, for joining us this morning. Um, so in my next five minutes or so, I just wanna kind of go over the white paper, what our motivations were for it, how it's structured, uh, what the purpose of it really is. And um, so let's start off here. So really our motivation for the white paper is uh, as you can see on the screen here, the Department of, of Energy has put together this GeoVision report back in 2019, and they identified um, avenues going forward for expansion of geothermal energy across the US. And as you can see in this slide, um, Illinois has uh, potential for expanding geothermal energy, both in capacity and in um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so going towards 2050, geothermal heat pumps could expand uh, across the uh, across the state, particularly in Chicago area, Central Illinois, and, and East Central and East St. Louis area. And then district heating, as Ryan just mentioned, is another uh, um, way of connecting multiple buildings together in neighborhoods and cities, and that also has the same potential. So Illinois is really at the forefront of uh, of this expansion, and that's really why we're we're trying to promote this um, technology, this uh, way of using the Earth's uh, natural thermal energy uh, to better communities, better home homeowners and businesses and uh, cities and towns. And then uh, the white paper um, was an outgrowth of a campus living laboratory uh, grant that uh, both Dr. Lynn and Dr. Bezer uh, uh, received from the Institute of Sustainability, Energy and Environment uh, on the campus. And so they were really the, the, the two that kind of came up with this idea of, of writing a white paper so that we could provide information, not only to researchers and the uh, geothermal industry, but also to stakeholders, people interested in the technology, the public, so the white paper is structured so that we provide a lot of information, uh, both technical and um, economic and uh, information about uh, financial uh, um, 
grants and, and other things. So it's not just one, one uh, group we're, we're focusing on, we're focusing on uh, a large group across Illinois and uh, the US Midwest. So here's the white paper. Um, it's structured in, in uh, several different sections. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Amy Weckel and her cohort of students that really have made it possible to put this online. Um, it's going to be, it's a wiki format in that it can be updated regularly uh, pretty quickly. So I've already taken comments from some people that have emailed me about things they wanted to see or things that they would like to change. So I've already started editing this. And so a new version of this will come out probably in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I've added additional um, technologies under section two because there's a possibility of using uh, abandoned mine land and mines for geothermal energy. So that's one of the sections I've added there. And someone else recommended uh, talking about um, dual systems where you're using um, both air source heat pumps and geothermal heat pumps together uh, in to make one system at, in homes. So that's another uh, topic I've, I've tried to cover with that. Um, so then, um, Section three is on policies and regulations. Um, there are some regulations for uh, geothermal heat pumps. They're mostly at the state level and then that's kind of decentralized to the county level uh, health departments. Um, but there are also uh, federal and state uh, policies for uh, like deep direct use where we're drilling thousands of feet underground to directly use the heated brines and water down there. So. Uh, that section, the section uh, talks about that. And then um, programs for funding, um, tried to cover a lot of the different uh, places you can find funding. I even tried to include uh, a section on uh, all the electrical cooperatives in the state because they have their own programs. So really sections three and four I see as being places we would be updating regularly because there's always new programs coming out uh, to fund uh, geothermal energy systems. Um, and section five is really focused on uh, talking about the use of geothermal energy in different sectors of the, of the economy and different uh, aspects of uh, for, uh, different um, uses, uh, whether it's agri for agriculture or at ed educational institutions. Uh, Frank Holcomb will talk uh, after me about uh, how the military, the DOD, is, is, is thinking about using geothermal energy systems for their installations. Um, and then really the last three sections is talking about how, how we can grow, how we can grow the, the use of geothermal energy across the state and in the U.S. Midwest. Um, uh, what are the barriers to this, to using the technology? and how will it affect both the economic, environmental, and, um, and job and community growth uh, sectors. Um, really, we, when we first looked at this, we didn't really see any kind of resource, uh, educational resource for the US Midwest. Mostly uh, people had talked about um, the West Coast or the East Coast. So we thought there was a niche here that we could, we could cover that would uh, provide information to the Midwestern U.S. Uh, region about geothermal energy. And with the passage of the uh, Climate Equitable uh, Jobs Act in Illinois, um, we see more legislation coming forward in the future that will directly um, talk to geothermal energy in the state. And I think that will then provide other opportunities for job, job uh, growth and economic development um, in and around uh, geothermal energy and geothermal heat pumps. So that's all I have now, and I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to Frank to talk about the uh, DOD uh, installations. Thank you. Frank, Frank you are still muted. Thank, thank you. I had to 
I dropped off and had to join again, so apologies for that. I, I'm Frank Holcomb. I'm a researcher with the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center. I have a few slides and remarks I'd like to make, and our offices are located here in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, actually, because of the University of Illinois, we have a, a partnership with them. This laboratory was formed in 1969. Bear with me one moment, and I'll get my screen up here. And Jay, all good on screen? Looks good. Okay, thank you. So yeah, I'm gonna speak a little bit about requirements and put things in the context of geothermal and use in the military and actually the federal government. So Mr. Doherty and, and Professor Stump talked about some of the driving requirements. And as it turns out, the federal government and the army and the Department of Defense have a lot of similar requirements. Although with a little bit of a different slant. We do have a lot of the same sustainability requirements, but in particular, we have an important resilience requirement, which again, the geothermal technology can help us support. So I've, on this screen, I've listed some of the, the strategic drivers. A lot of this has been driven by Executive Order 14057. That should be a seven there. And this talks a lot about decarbonization and electrification. So the Army and DOD have their own strategic goals and a lot of this is about mission. And when you think about the, the mission of the Army and the DOD, this could be training troops, mobilizing troops. Think about the Army National Guard or just the National Guard in general, which has a slightly different mission with regards to disaster relief and, and other components. So one of the things here is uh, we are, uh, the, the Department of Defense has acknowledged that climate change is happening. It can affect mission. Think about wildfires in the West, storms, droughts, uh, other things which could include man-made influences, even human error can affect mission. And any sort of disruption can cause a, a change in mission. So the Army in 2017 came out with a policy that, finally, that put a definition towards resilience. And it stated that these facilities that support critical missions have to have a minimum of 14 days of energy and water supply. So that was a, a pretty big requirement. And in looking across the portfolio of supply coming in, energy supply, including renewable energy, there's a very strong emphasis on decarbonization. So renewable energy, even Nuclear is fossil fuel energy free. It has no carbon emissions. And on the load side, looking at those technologies that do not burn carbon or fossil fuels, such as natural gas or fuel oil. And that's really where, as you'll see, I think in some of the subsequent presentations, a large part of the energy usage, even at military facilities, includes heating and cooling. And if we can get away from burning natural gas or burning fuel oil to, for heat in particular, to using geothermal, which has inherent efficiencies, which Mr. Doherty talked about, and uses electricity, which we can source locally through ideally renewable energy sources, then it's a win-win situation. Uh, Andy talked about the white paper. And in Illinois, there are three major DOD installations. You've got Great Lakes Naval Air Station or Great Lakes Naval Station in Chicago. You've got Scout Air Force Base down by St. Louis and Rock Island Arsenal up in the Quad Cities. Each of them has a slightly different mission, different energy requirements, and then a whole host over 50 National Guard facilities across the state and reserve centers. So there's a fairly large presence of military facilities in Illinois that can benefit from this technology. So what, what is resilience? I'd mentioned resilience and how that's a pretty big piece of the DOD requirements these days. I like to think of it in terms of an acronym, P-A-R-A, -A, prepare, absorb, recover, and adapt. Anytime there is a, a disruption, everybody is kind of in the preparation mode of, okay, what could happen next? Whether it's a flood, a, a fire, a tornado, cyber attack, what have you. Uh, everybody's kind of making preparations. But then when something happens, it could be a short duration event or a longer duration event. 
you kind of have to get through it. And whatever technologies you have for energy resilience, whether it's a backup generator or something else, you, you get through it, you eventually get back online. So that's the recover phase. And then afterwards, it's always the lessons learned. What happened? How did, how did this work out? So how can we adapt for the next go round? And it's a continuous circle, as you can see here. You're always in this mode of preparing because in some sense, you don't know what could happen next. We've seen a lot of things that perhaps weren't prepared for, but as you go through these events, then you wanna make sure that you're prepared for the next one. That's really the definition of resilience. Energy security is a little bit different and that looks to sources of energy and how far away they may be. And if there's a disruption, generally you'd like to have your sources of energy closer to you and from sources that you can rely on. We're seeing some of this play out in Eastern Europe right now in the war in Ukraine, where the army and DOD have military installations over in Central Europe. And a lot of them rely on natural gas and fuel oil, which a lot of that is in Europe comes from Russia. Now there's a prohibition on the Department of Defense purchasing any fuel or energy from Russia but everything is so intertwined over there, it's kind of hard to get guarantees that one molecule of natural gas, for example, is not coming from Russia. So a lot of the countries over there right now are kind of scrambling as to what are they going to do if they have their gas cut off or their fuel oil cut off. And again, if geothermal heat pumps, having that local source of supply for their heating could really help out. Uh, this last slide I have is really kind of a, a, a cartoon of an example installation that has a lot of different elements built in. It has supply from two different sides, the north and the south coming in. It has fuel on site in case of an outage, even water. The, the Department of Defense does consider both energy and water with regards to its requirements and resilience in particular. So on site generation, I have geothermal heat pl plant here again, providing local source of heating and cooling for the installation and, and other aspects here. So this is something that all of the installations are trying to get to some level of autonomy, get to some level where they're not dependent on outside sources of, of, of energy supplies and also that whole decarbonization and electrification movement to get away from fuels that create CO2 carbon emissions and look to more electrified sources of energy. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Josian. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Can you see my screen well? Looks good. All right. So I'm going to continue discussing the different applications of uh, uh, how to implement geothermal energy in other sectors. So in the residential sector, currently in Illinois, uh, we consume on 44% more than the average consumption in the US. And geothermal energy accounts for a very negligible portion of uh, that energy source. An international study by Revoir et al. in 2018 performed numerical simulations to assess the energy efficiency, economic, and environmental benefits of geothermal heat pumps in six different European cities with six different climatic conditions. So after looking at those different regions, uh, we observed that Zone D is very similar to uh, Illinois with an average annual temperature of 12 degrees Celsius. So if you look closely at this, the discount payback period of that is approximately 12 years. And this can be reduced by uh, adding taxes to fuels and to energy, uh, to electricity consumption and through incentives and progressive policies. Also, they performed an environmental analysis. And as we can see, increasing the, or implement, deploying geothermal energy can lead to a decrease in the CO2 emissions. 
In the uh, commercial sector, the energy consumption is 20.4% of the overall energy consumption in the state. And it is that energy is usually consumed in buildings owned by businesses, federal, state, and local governments, and other private and public organizations. So an example of deploying the geothermal system in, uh, in a commercial setting is at the ASHRAE headquarters. And the benefits of uh, that were reduction in the energy cost by 20 to 40 percent, lower, uh, lower maintenance and life cycle cost, smaller footprint for mechanical equipment, and longer lifespan, uh, which, is, which spans between 30 to 50 years. In the industrial sector, the energy consumption in uh, the state is 31.3%. And uh, usually it's uh, uh, the, the manufacturing in, uh, in Illinois is on chemical machinery and food and be beverage ma manufacturing. And those usually industrial processes contribute to energy losses through heat streams. And one study suggested collecting that excess heat through geothermal heat pumps uh, to lead to energy savings. So we collect that excess heat and we use it somewhere else. And that would lead to energy savings, higher energy efficiency and sustainability. In the manufacturing system, so the state employs more than 78,000 people in the industry and the gross rating product is 12.3 billion. And uh, as discussed earlier, mainly uh, those, uh, those applications are food processing uh, and they need the energy for heating, cooling and drying and to maintain specific temperatures in those environments. So uh, this plot here shows the average energy demand for different uh, food processing applications and uh, deploying geothermal energy can lead to decarbonizing the food and beverage industry, addressing the need to manage thermal energy and heat recovery and make uh, process processing more energy efficient. So in the agriculture sector, Illinois is considered a leading producer of swine, soybean and uh, uh, corn along any other, uh, many other agricultural commodities. So uh, uh, one study recommended harvesting waste heat from uh, wastewater livestock farms to achieve financial saving and decrease air pollution. And they suggested different applications uh, uh, to do with that from that excess uh, waste heat. So one was uh, the heating water can be used for cleaning stands, watering, and preparing animal feed. Another application can be for watering and plant production. One is for cereal drying installation and for prepa preparing hot utility water in a farmer's apartment building. Uh, the last sector that we're gonna discuss is the uh, educational sector. So switching from fossil fuel to geothermal, geothermal energy will provide healthier environment for students inside and outside of the uh, facility, which can improve to their, uh, which can lead to improvement in their academic performance. So. Uh, Additionally, geothermal uh, systems would be installed in the basement, which will uh, reduce the noises and uh, will free up some spaces uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in the outdoor areas for other applications. So Illinois has been a very, pro very pro proactive in reducing uh, energy costs and installing geothermal systems. So for example, uh, there, there are currently there are installations in 15 schools as of 2021, and this is an example in, uh, uh, in uh, nicely junior high. Another uh, example is at Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, this is a greenhouse lab for geothermal uh, energy. And uh, uh, Yufang already discussed the many applications here on campus at UIUC. So thank you so much for your attention, and I will now move to Professor Tuche. All right, hello everyone, my colleagues and my PhD student Josiane covered the background and ongoing research at Illinois and uh, overall in Midwest. So and I would like to talk a little bit about the benefits and impacts of the increased geothermal energy deployment across uh, Midwest and also the United States and as well as in local communities and uh, for both environmental and economical aspects of it. So we are talking about uh, increasing the number of geothermal system deployment, but what is going to, how it's going to help us. Uh, it will improve the resiliency of the energy system, and it will ensure a secure and reliable resource of heating and cooling. 
So it will also support training and employing community members, which will ensure environmental justice and the inclusion of undeserved communities. So now let's unfold those benefits by one by one and talk about them a little bit in detail. So I would like to start with the environmental benefits of it. So increased number of the deployment would improve the air quality and the reduced carbon emissions. So we've, we've been talking about carbon emissions, right? And how it's gonna do that, there are mainly two ways. I mean, of course, there are multiple ways to do this, but I'm gonna talk about only two. The first one is you're, we are trying to through um, the geothermal heat pumps or geothermal systems overall, we are trying to increase the performance of the heat pump that our geothermal will be connected with. So that increase in the coefficient of performance leads to um, less electricity usage and thus the uh, less carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Another uh, way to, um, to environmentally make it more beneficial is uh, utilizing existing wells like uh, oil and gas wells, especially in Southern Illinois and a little bit of Indiana, uh, which are those um, matured wells, uh, gas wells are, um, you know, um, are abundant. And by utilizing those wells, we are blocking um, potential methane leak waste into the atmosphere, and then we are taking advantage of um, using those existing wells so that we are eliminating the durable costs and also um, the carbon emissions that we um, release into the atmosphere during drilling. So this also uh, increased uh, deployment results in clean energy community development, which is a very important uh, topic right now. We've been discussing it across the United States, all those stakeholders, policymakers, we are all moving from single family geothermal heat pumps or geothermal systems towards the uh, community development. There is a big push because so far our understanding of the um, one thing, our understanding or technologies that are scalable uh, on the community level are key components. And so far, our uh, understanding of that is establishing that the approaches that uh, we use or technology that we use for a single family home installation is very well established. So now it is our time to uh, to make them make these systems more scalable and uh, to, to at the community scale so that it is more beneficial, both in environmental scale and also uh, economical um, space as well. So economic and workforce development. Um, so this means increased number of jobs, new line of in the energy industry, and also reinstating oil and gas industry professionals. So now there's a big shift from oil and uh, you know, decarbonizing our industry which I think from my perspective and from my colleagues' perspective, it's a very good opportunity for all of us to, in, to increase the, the deployment of the geothermal systems. Uh, I think it's one of the key components of the carbonization of the industry. And by doing this, we will be uh, creating a new line of in jobs and also uh, shifting our focus by keeping the jobs uh, um, as well. So in terms of workforce development, uh, so with these new uh, industry, we need, uh, you know, people with diversity of job skills, right, um, including mechanics, pipe fitters, plumbers, uh, electricians, carpenters. I think I have a really good example uh, story uh, for this. Uh, when we were working with the contractors for the Hydro Systems Building Energy Foundation project uh, a couple of years ago, and they, the contractors did not have any experience with the installation of energy foundations before. So with my help, with my students' help, our research group helped them, uh, you know, how to install such system because it was a very simple, straightforward and no brainer, um, you know, technology. So we taught them how to do, uh, how to install these energy foundations. And now I'm pretty sure they're very fluent and efficient in installing these such systems. And now, uh, they add this expertise in their um, uh, in their uh, services as well. So now you know enough about geothermal energy and their significant benefits uh, so far. But you, if you don't know uh, where to start or continue, so you have you know um, you have like no idea where to start, or you you just like block in this process uh, to moving forward. 
So we do have some training opportunities and technical assistance resources for you. So for example, we have Geothermal Alliance of Illinois, uh, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that works to advance the geothermal heat pump industry in Illinois. Um, and they do offer in-person accredited training and uh, to geothermal contractors, loop installers, and drilling contact to contractors as well. So we also have International Ground Source Heat Pump Association, which is a nonprofit organization as well. And we have Smart Energy Design Assistance Center at Illinois. And also you have us here. Uh, you have um, uh, access to our email addresses, our work addresses, phone numbers, and such. Uh, if you need any help, we are here uh, for both like training and advising and also providing your technical assistances as well. Well, thank you so much for the attention. So I'm going to uh, give it over to uh, Dr. Lin. Thank you very much, Tushi. And <clears throat> so uh, one last thing, and uh, I, I kind of want to... Uh, conclude all my colleagues have been shared here is this white paper, or you just type uh, geothermal.edu slash wiki, you will see this document. And actually I was just on a document and it become a little bit slower. I guess what, probably a lot of people are exploring this document right now, and which is a good problem to have. I'm happy to see that. And, but I have to give the credit to the team who really put a lot of effort and to put this document together. And the whole team is uh, has been led by uh, Dr. Stumpf at the Illinois State Geological Survey uh, Pre-Research Institute. And also Frank, Jacina, Tushi, they all put a lot of effort on making this document. Uh, it's a really nice structure here. And then the big bone was uh, supported by the Illinois Water Resource Center and Amy Wacko and uh, Sudan Kushman. And no, those group effort is really, really try to that every of you uh, who come to join uh, this webinar to know this resource is ready for you and also for your future generation come to take a look. And that's why we'll try to make this document as a living document, as we say, uh, as update as possible. So again, by doing that, this needs your help. So whenever you have a new information and then you like to contribute or you want to discuss and feel free to join us. And then we have contact information on the website, the Illinois uh, Geosummer Coalition website and then contact us and let us know. And then um, leave the feedback and that we will really appreciate um, your input. And again, this is really got to be a community effort, no matter um, you are scientist, industrial or user, or even thinking about this for the future, because I mean, what we're doing here um, is really not just for ourselves, and but also for our future generations. And then again, I want to uh, really appreciate the, the, the people who involve all of this, and then also campus community. We have a fantastic student group who really pushing our older generation to go forward and a lot of uh, uh, campus administrator, uh, Morgan White, even our chancellor and our president are really supportive on this. So uh, without me keep talking here and I would like to uh, pass this, I think it's to Jay next to see if we can do some discussion here, right, Jay? That's right, thank you very much. Thanks for wrapping this back up for us. <clears throat> So we had, we, we had a few questions, um, and I'll start with kind of one that was started off as we really got started, and that's, uh, are there home thermostats that can factor in the ground loop return temperature uh, in making the decision to switch a ge geothermal system to natural gas, electric, or propane backup uh, heat in times when it's very cold? Anybody want to take a shot at that one? I'll, I'll go, Jay. Um, and 
just to be clear, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm not a technical guy. I'm a policy nerd. And sorry for my videos being a little wonky, so I'll just turn it off. Um, yes, you can You can have, I think the, the question sort of centers around um, integrated controls for a hybrid system. So could your thermostat, it, now it wouldn't be handled at the thermostat level, but there, there are control schemes and technology that where you could basically set, have a set point where you're saying, okay, let's hand it off to this because it's gotten cold enough that we want the propane to kind of back it up. The thing that's important to remember about geothermal though, is that if they are properly designed and installed to meet the thermal energy needs of the building, there's no need for propane or gas. Just yank that off, cut the pipeline, and you know, go forth with an all electric solution. Because as I said in my presentation, and, and Frank touched on this as well, that's the key thing about the, the technology. It's, it's using the earth. And if even when it's minus 10 degrees outside, say there's a cold snap and it's just, there's a polar vortex for two weeks on end, um, that ground next to the building is still in the 50, 52 degree range. And so you're just going to use that constant temperature of the earth, no need for a switch off. Thank you. And, and having a little experience, it's not quite like our grand, our parents or grandparents uh, early heat pump or, or air source heat pump or uh, geothermal systems were things technology has moved quite a bit in those days in the in these in the changes so thank you um which does kind of build on a second question here if thousands or millions of buildings and industry use temperatures temperature from the earth pull energy from the earth would the temperature of the earth be negatively affected Uh, I say I'm heavy to take that one as a researcher here. So what's we'll thing about the earth, the layer we are scrapping is just like, uh, how do I say that? Very, very minimum. So think about a whole deck of the, you know, your, 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 your toilet paper at home. And then the, the, the thickness we are using right now, for example, using ground source heat pump, probably only you know, one sheet of real toilet paper on that. So this is kind of a knowledge on, on how big is the magnitude we are talking about here. And then the temperature, the temperature on Earth is, is, is relatively much more stable than air and water temperature. But, 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 but really, Seriously, we cannot say Earth's temperature is always a constant because Earth is also a dynamic system too. And uh, the, the temperature we are using is very, very sufficient over the Earth's temperature. It will, it will have a, a, a tiny, tiny change uh, at some certain depths because of ambient or because of the uh, climate condition or because of the deep Earth. But, it's really, really, really small. So that's why in the earlier slide uh, during my presentation, when we see that fluctuation of temperature, I didn't really point out, but if you got a chance to see the recording and we are talking about the scale is 0 0.01 degrees Celsius and which is very small of it. So hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think it's what that's a conversation that we quite frequently have, and, and thank you for for addressing that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, there was a question here about how can the technology be made economical enough for single family uh, residential use? And I know there's been quite a bit of information put out there in the 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 chat as a response to this. Would anybody like to kind of encapsulate some of that response? But I think that's one that we quite frequently get and, and probably is important to a good good group of people. Jay, I'm happy to chime in. Um, there are some great links and references in the chat. 
uh, geothermal does cost uh, more to install, but the life cycle cost, the ongoing operating cost of the technology is the most affordable long-term solution. It's going to lower your ongoing energy bills significantly over versus any other type of equipment. So the question is, how do you kind of get, a, get across that higher upfront cost barrier to, to get the, the constant continuous benefits? Because these systems last a very, very long time. Once you put the pipes in the ground, they're gonna be there probably longer than the home is. Um, and then the, the heat pump itself usually lasts, as tw lasts twice as long as, the, um, as other comparable heating and cooling equipment because it's protected from the elements. So the answer about attacking first cost is center, kind of centers around what are the opportunities for incentives or other subsidies or affordable financing to, to get the technology deployed in any particular setting. And there are a, a range we're very lucky in Illinois to have uh, in ComEd service territory in Northern Illinois, them offering very, very significant incentives in the form of a rebate. Uh, there are tax credits in the, um, in the Inflation Reduction Act that a homeowner would be eligible for. And there are also forthcoming state uh, govern or state overseeing rebates that are also part of the Inflation Reduction Act that you're gonna be able to stack on top of the other incentives. So when you combine all these different pots of money, the, the, the systems become very, very affordable, even from a, an upfront cost perspective. And so you're getting that, you're, you're reaping that reward of um, a lower ongoing energy costs and you're breaking even, so to speak, at a much sooner date than you would otherwise. And I hope that sums, sums it up and, and provides some context. Yes, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I, uh, you hit upon the, the pieces that I, I think people need to be aware of. Um, and may, may I add a little bit information? Because on the chat, uh, I also put in the, we as a scientist has been working uh, very closely with the industry and we try to bring the cost down. So I just put it short sentence, but I, I, I like this opportunity uh, to elaborate a little bit. It, it, what research the research we are doing right now is not only simply just you know uh, 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 engineering technology. We are also looking at all of the possibility. So, for example, uh, one approach you are thinking about we are trying to evaluate about is like a thick street geothermal. So, for example, instead of every house have their own uh, boreholes and their own uh, heat pumps. Can we make this more like community effort? So instead of a whole community and have a geothermal ball field, and then so geothermal is, is become a more like a utility. So for example, like your water supply, okay, your, your electricity, instead of every house got to think about, oh, do I need to invest this or not? Okay, that's one of research area. And the other is, for example, uh, in the subsurface, because right at current, current stage, the most of the cost is drilling part of it. Can we make drilling more uh, efficient and then less expensive by understand subsurface? And then also by understand subsurface, can we help the design process in more, uh, more intelligent? I mean, the thing about it is right now we're in 21st century, right? We are talking about using AI uh, to, to, to compose a lot of work already. Can we use such technology and based on our database, uh, geological database, and to help all the design process of it? Or even the original boho loop, uh, 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 boho and the geothermal loop system, can we design something even more efficient uh, with new material? and new geometry design of it. So this is just that everybody knows. It's, 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 that's why we have such big team and work on different process of it. Like Professor Tucci, uh, she has been working on foundations. So when, what if the drilling is free? When there's a new building, you don't need to drill. I mean, you, you are, you're, you're digging for the foundation already, right? So I see one of our reviewer, uh, one of our viewer here, actually he's a visiting professor from Taiwan and he's working on buried the geosome exchange loop in the, the wall of your basement of that. 
So those are all new technology we are working on right now. So please come to visit our website and visit our, our, our research sites and uh, you'll be surprised how, how, how many new things will come up. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you chiming in there. That's perfect. I want to remind everybody, if you would, uh, Nancy has fired out a, a uh, poll here. If you would, just click on a, a response. We really appreciate that feedback to know where things were at and, and kind of where we might go from here. Um, I know that that Ryan said he had to take off. We've got one other question here that, that I've heard before, and I know we've talked about it in the group. Uh, individuals concerned over deep wells being groundwater contamination vectors uh, said they chose to do uh, lateral lines for their ag, ag uh, shop building and house. Um, and the, the concern there is about the, the, the depth of uh, potential for uh, contamination of both deep vectors, but they also use plenty of depth to slow any contamination events uh, from getting into the aquifer. But what are the plans to limit use in sensitive or shallow water table regions? You fang, Andy, you uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just try to unmute myself here. Is well, Andy, feel free to chimp uh, coming anytime. Is over. Uh, let, let me kind of give a, a, a higher level of explanation about geothermal, the term of geothermal. Actually, it covers a lot of different technology of it. And then so, so just kind of tells you how many more we're talking about. In, in, in Department of Energy's definition, they, they published a very important document called GeoVision 2019. GeoVision, one word, Google it. You can see from the feature 2.7, you can see DOE Singapore, we have about 11 applications of geothermal in the country. And then in that diagram, they even separate high geothermal, low geothermal for uh, the, the, the threshold is 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And then not only a temperature, but application is separate to two parts. One is uh, energy generation. So it's to generate electricity and also direct use, which is not general electricity. And all it, it is four quadrants. There are 11 different ways of using geothermal. So what we are talking about earlier here, when Ryan talked about ground source heat pump, it's just one of the application. And then even ground source heat pump, you can have open loop, closed loop, horizontal loop, vertical loop. And right now we are working on something, even a prototype called underground thermal battery which is not really the battery you buy from the Costco or, you know, <laughs> the, the Walmart. It is an energy storage type of thing. So, so there, there's a lot of way to do geothermal. And then when we go back to that question about groundwater contamination, and uh, it, I guess that's the open loop design. And, and here we, we use a lot of closed loop and which should not be an issue because the, the liquid to do a geothermal exchange is all contained inside this tube. It, it, it doesn't use groundwater, pump groundwater to, to the system. And, and if you pump groundwater and then get it in to somewhere else, that's called closed loop. And uh, in our, the majority of our uh, residential use in Illinois, doesn't use that approach. Mainly it's using closed loop and we should not have any threat to groundwater. And also even a closed loop, the borehole is crowded. So it's really good seal of it. And then we have in, in the state, we have regulation uh, monitored by public health, Department of Public Health. And they are looking at this very closely. So, so based on my understanding of, without knowing the more detail about this question, that would be something uh, I want to share. So Andy, anything I missed? Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, Roy was asking about uh, horizontal loops. Um, so for those, they're closed loop systems and um, uh, there's not gonna be any leakage from the pipe. Um, they actually will perform better if they're underwater for most of the time because uh, um, water carries heat better than air. So if there actually would be more, run more efficient, but there are issues with uh, digging 
the trenches for the horizontal loops. Uh, if there's groundwater, uh, they'd have to pump out the trenches to get the to install the loop. So, uh, but the health departments have very strict regulations on on um, contamination and and even offsets from water lines and um, septic fields. So there's um, ways or regulations that you need to follow to install these systems. And hopefully that answered the question. Um, I think there was a couple of questions in there about, well, there's a couple of questions about uh, links to the white paper and links to the recording. Uh, we will include that in the follow-up uh, email message that's sent to everyone so that you've got those live links. Um, also in that, uh, you'll have a link back to Nancy and to, I'll ask her to put a, a link to me as well. Um, if you've got questions, um, be glad to uh, handle those, either try to answer myself or I have access and we, we have access to this whole group of people uh, and can can get the messages to them. Um, and you're welcome to, to contact them directly, but knowing how uh, sometimes tracking down all the email addresses and stuff can be, uh, Nancy and I can serve as a, as a point of contact for you. Um, unless there's other comments from any rest of the group, um, I do appreciate, I guess we should make a comment before I say that notice that a couple of people made some very nice comments about their successes with, um, geothermal and, and, uh, some, op some groups that are trying to pull together to do some community things. So appreciate that being shared as well. Uh, and we'll try to capture those from the, the chat file as well. So thank you. And Jay, there's a question there just came in. Can horizontal loops be installed the same way as underground utilities? Yeah, actually, they um, you could instead of trenching, you can also use um, like um, directional drilling um, rigs uh, to install the pipes. So yeah, you can you can use the same technology for installing fiber optic lines for um, internet and things. You can use the same drilling uh, uh, rig for that for the, putting the pipes in. The, the horizontal boring. Yeah. And just wanted to make a note, if anybody has any comments about the white paper, please send them along to me and I'll, I'll try and address them in the next versions. Um, and if, if there's any con content you want to add, uh, please send it to me. I can definitely add it. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank our presenters for, for the uh, great presentations today. I know we went just a little bit long here, but I think we had a lot of great information to try to be covered. So. With that, I would like to thank all of you.